Good morning, afternoon, what is it? <laughs> um, I suggest we make this quite informal. How many of you are economists or study economy? Okay, I just want to make it clear that I'm not. <laughs> um, as, as Peter said, I'm a journalist. Um, but I've been following digital, the internet and digital issues for the last 30 years. Um, and now looking more at the economic side uh, of the issues. So I'm, what I want to do is throw out some sort of general reflections uh, on the digitalization of the economy. Um, can, am I talking loud enough? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, sort of three or four ideas in general, um, and then some of the possible answers that we're looking at to this, and then we can open uh, an exchange. Um, when we talk about digitalization, um, we're talking about the rapid penetration in most areas of life of digital technologies, the economy, social life, culture, politics, uh, which is catalyzing transformations very rapidly. Um, but it's doing so under a model dominated by corporate monopolies with the dangers that incurs, which wasn't the only model possible when the internet started out, and it wasn't even obvious that that would be the model when it started out. Um, so I want to look briefly at three issues. One is the US-China trade war. The second one is the digital economy and data, and briefly at trade agreements and then very briefly the impact on certain sectors um, and, and then some alternatives. So the current US-China trade war, uh, the underlying issue, it, it seems, it looks as though it's about tariffs, but it's not really the issue. The underlying issue is who will dominate uh, digital technologies and in particular artificial intelligence. <coughs> Uh, the U.S. is demanding that China make profound transformations in its industrial policy and technological development, as well as strict restrictions on the transfer of technology and intellectual property. All they're offering in return, basically, is to seesaw lower the tariff increases. And for China, obviously, this is unacceptable. The U.S. economy so far continues to be, although although there's number one in technology and artificial, in some areas of technology and artificial intelligence, they are largely still focused on oil and oil pad development. <coughs> um, and China is rapidly catching up and surpassing them in the technology sector. Especially in high technology, the change of energy matrix to renewables and clean energy and if the U.S. is putting tariffs on Chinese goods, it's because they can't compete. Um, the U.S. is accusing China of stealing intellectual property to develop its technology, but ignoring the fact that the Chinese are actually making huge investments in their own research and development, in education, uh, in startups, um, and so are gaining an advantage over the US with much cheaper technology, which is therefore um, uh, more of a commercial success uh, globally. In the short term, it would seem that the most sensitive issue is 5G technology, which is the, the new generation, um, which is a requirement for the Internet of Things. Uh, and for high-speed transactions, e-commerce, etc. Uh, in parenthesis, I'm not really sure that we need the Internet of Things, but they definitely think we do. Um, you know, do we really need to have the Internet in our fridge? Um, <laughs> but obviously, for the technology companies, this is necessary because this gives them more data, and more data gives them better artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, the US is, uh, China took the lead with Huawei, was negotiating with Europe, because from other things, it's offering a lot of cost for 5G technology. 
so the US immediately sought to discredit Huawei, accusing them of violating securities, which is something they do regularly, but that's okay, of course. In the, meantime, in the medium term, uh, the Chinese strategy is to dominate in globally in artificial intelligence within five to 10 years. Um, and one of the, among the advantages they have over the US is a very numerous population, which means more data, uh, so better artificial intelligence. Um, and I, one of the strategies I understand they're focusing on is to offer their services particularly to other developing countries that have societies more similar to their own, with you know, a poorer population in general, um, which also have very numerous populations. So again, more more data and more better artificial intelligence. Um, it's even thought that maybe most other countries will soon have to negotiate their dependency with either China or, this, or the United States for their, for their artificial intelligence as the two uh, superpowers in this. The second thing uh, I want to touch on briefly is that the digital economy is the fastest growing in industry in the US. Um, among the major technology drivers behind this are the fact that the internet, one, the internet has led to a huge increase in the connectivity of devices, and two, the increase in computational speeds of the connected devices means that there's a qualitative dif difference between previous forms of mechanization and what uh, some people call the intelligentsification of the economy. Um, which means that the top corporations, the top digital corporations, now are the brains of different sectors of the economy. So it's not just the mechanical, the mechanics, it's, it's, it's the, how they operate. Those who own digital intelligence have power over those about whom such intelligence concerns. Even if these peop the people it concerns access services that use this intelligence, they don't control. Uh, the digital, as I mentioned at the outset, the digital economy is rapidly becoming monopolized. Um, we have the, what's sometimes known as GAFAM, Google, Apple, Microsoft, um, uh, Alibaba, and um, Google, Apple, Facebook. No, Alibaba's another one, I've lost one. Amazon and Microsoft. Although some people add in IBM and call it the G Mafia, which I like better. Um, they're among the, the companies with the highest stock market prices now. It used to be the oil companies and some big banks, and now it's, now it's mainly the technological companies. The Chinese, some of the Chinese companies are fairly close behind. Data, it's often said data has become the main business input of the digital economy. The large monopolies don't usually have to pay for the raw material they extract from all of us as we, as we use Facebook, Google, and so on, uh, which is obviously a huge, a huge advantage for them. Most smaller companies purchase processed data from the large data brokers that monetize people's data by processing and then reselling them, often as personal profiles to advertisers. Um, uh, the sector is largely unregulated and little is known about how it really operates. The revenues derived from these operations totaled almost $53 billion in 2016 and $76 billion in 2018. That's a, almost a 50% increase in just two years. And if this tendency continues, it could reach almost 116 billion by 2020 and 100 and almost, almost two, uh, 200 billion by 2022. That's just three years away. But the digital economy, in fact, is about more than just data. 
Um, the when the company is talking about the fourth industrial revolution, sometimes referred to it as a fusion of technologies that's blurring the lines between the digital, digital, and biological spheres. Um, the data is a new oil paradigm mm -hmm. that the World Economic Forum talks about a lot, is, um, uh, which is the business model of social media and search engine giants, which is largely linked to advertising <laughs> as their, their source of revenue, doesn't fully explain all the digital monopolies, their, their power, their economic power such as the continued expansion of older companies like Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon, or the rise of the new uh, monopolies like Uber and Airbnb. They, they obviously use data, but it's not necessarily their main uh, source of, of revenue. Um, the Premier Purke Yasta of India um, says that monopolies like IBM in mainframes, Microsoft software for PCs, or Apple uh, hardware and software for PCs and for iPhones, depending for their growth basically on intellectual property, uh, copyright of a proprietary software, hardware, and design patents, much the way Walt Disney is dependent on, on intellectual property rules. And since then, the TRIPS and WTO agreements and the free trade agreements have further strengthened the intellectual property regime. So digital monopolies are built in a way on a similar, similar capitalist model uh, to the previous ones, where uh, capital use whatever it would take to create a lot monopoly and extract surplus, not just directly from labor, but also of monopoly rent from others. Um, and that explains why Microsoft and Apple um, as digital monopolies based on intellectual property continue to flourish and also figure in the top five companies by market capitalization. So he says that the reality is that creating audience demographies out of user data economically is a new form of enclosure. I presume you're familiar with the idea of the enclosure of the commons. Um, yes? No, no. The, in the Industrial Resolu Revolution, the enclosure of the commons was when um, the common land was enclosed and privatized. Okay. And that idea of enclosure of the commons is referred to now by those who defend um, the commons in knowledge, the commons in, in, in the mm -hmm. digital sphere, and so on. So things that should be common property mm -hmm. yeah, and are being privatized for private capitalization. And profit. So, um, personal data, for example, used not to be a commodity. It's quite recent that it's become a commodity. And these companies capture and enclose this data, including from people's social interactions, and process it into audience demographies. Um, profile the different audiences um, that converts it into a commodity. Uh, intellectual property as a form of enclosure of the commons has been widely discussed among others by the commons movement. Um, so when we talk about uh, intellectual property on music rights on the internet, for example, uh, it's a way of preventing what everyone would consider normal, which is to share things on the internet. So you have to put restrictions on that so that capital can t continue to make profit out of uh, out of those those elements but the enclosure of data of the commons has received much less attention so, and even the people who argue against the enclosure of user data the privatization of user data tend to focus on how it can be monetized by by the users rather than looking at it as part of the commons that shouldn't be privatized, either by companies or by individuals. So there's a new focus on a possible alternative to this corporate model, which will be uh, data as part of the commons. And Jenny Morisov says that the new platform monopolies assisted by financial capital, such as Uber and Airbnb, 
of a business model that helps youth platforms to enclose the informal sphere of the economy. This is another form of enclosure, which is converting individual um, vehicle and house owners to become so-called independent contractors, when in fact this is a new form of capital exploitation. Um, and Amazon and Alibaba, the big um, e-commerce giants, create the monopolies that create platforms to enclose shop owners and distributors' warehouses. Uh, or they become double-sided monopolies, both to their suppliers and to their buyers, as Walmart is. And um, we need to keep in mind that these digital monopolies won't necessarily diminish as the existing areas of their operation get saturated because they're constantly branching out into newer areas. So I'm touching on this briefly as a complex area, but throwing out some ideas that might be useful. As for the data advertising surveillance artificial intelligence um, business model, it is in itself based on surveillance. So when we talk about the massive violations of privacy and the loopholes in digital security that have come to light with cases like the Facebook Cambridge Analytica case, and they're usually treated as though they were accidents or malfunctioning of the system. <coughs> Basically, surveillance is an integral and essential part of the model itself. So these aren't accidents and they're not malfunctioning, it's the way that the other system's meant to operate. Um, with or without consent via the development of the mega platforms that offer free services. Uh, the third point, just briefly, the new tendency in trade agreements, this has been the case in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, in the new North America, uh, US, Canada, Mexican agreement, and there's now a lot of pressure in the World Trade Organization, is to include clauses on ele electronic commerce. Uh, basically, the idea is to guarantee the continued flow without obstacles of data to the big um, US corporations, the, the big uh, di digital corporations. So they're trying to impose requirements such as uh, countries can't demand local storage of data. Uh, they can't put tariffs on digital goods. There's already a moratorium that's temporary for the moment for tariffs on digital <coughs> goods and it's been shown that this moratorium isn't affecting developed con developing countries much more than developed countries. Um, completely open flow of data, no demands to open software for companies that invest in, in other countries, etc. And this means uh, if, in, in the WTO, the negotiations haven't been officially opened, and developing countries are resisting opening these negotiations, um, but they're actually already taking place informally. Um, and if they are opened, it would mean creating binding rules for a future economy that isn't yet even fully defined. So it means that countries would no longer be able to develop their own uh, e-commerce sector effectively because they'd be under binding rules that would affect them negatively. There's a discourse defending these negotiations that talks about e-commerce for development as being something favorable for small and medium companies in developing countries. Um, but many developing countries have understood that it will further restrict their ability to develop their own digital economy, and so they're resisting opening these negotiations as being a new form of colonialism and extractivism, extracting, instead of extracting gold and oil, extracting data for free. Um, there would be a whole other chapter that I'm not going to go into on the role of finance, of cryptocurrencies, exchange and so on that's changing rapidly. I don't know a lot about it. I know it's very important and I'm not going to go into it, but I just want to mention that that's a, another chapter that we should probably, we should probably be looking at. 
very briefly the impact on some of the different sectors because it's enormous and very widespread. Um, in particular, small producers, marginalized groups and communities that could benefit tremendously from digital technologies. Um, well, because they're being deployed in a context of an increasing national and global inequality gap. Uh, where the access to essential goods and services as well as to information and digital technologies and the internet are highly unequal. And while these inequalities aren't effectively addressed, new technologies are likely to reproduce and deepen existing patterns of discrimination. So that's a concern across the board. In the case of agriculture and the food system, for example, uh, the tendency is towards food without farmers. Uh, digital agriculture refers to the integration of advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence, sensor robotics, drones, uh, devices and communications networks into one single system and applying them to production, management, processing and marketing right across the, the, whole, the whole chain. Um, just to give an example, there's a lot of talk now about precision agriculture, <coughs> which basically means um, hyper-mechanized agriculture, <coughs> where there's a machine that says one seed goes here and a robot goes out and puts that seed in. Or the, what's called the Internet of Cows, where uh, individual animals are monitored with a chip by transnational <coughs> corporations. And so the farmers are losing control um, because all this information goes back to the big corporations that then tells the farmer what to do. So they're losing control of their own knowledge and their own, their own processes, and particularly the community, the local communities are losing control. Amazon and other uh, e-commerce companies now sell food direct to consumers, including organic food, um, which is affecting local stores, street sellers who are losing customers also affects local producers that depend on those local stores and street sellers. A new te biological technologies in genetic sequencing, gene editing, and so on in particular, are affecting rare uh, products that are rare and expensive to produce, such as vanilla, that is the source of income for a lot of communities with synthetic varieties, so that destroys produce, local producers' livelihoods. Um, but there are some small-scale farmers that are developing their own alternatives too, such as a group in the U.S. called FarmHack.org. So, I mean, if not everything is, is on the side of the, of the big corporate solutions. In work and labor, I won't go into detail, but there's a huge debate, as you probably know, on, on possible elimination of jobs, uh, particularly creation of more precarious jobs, such as the platform workers, like Uber drivers, um, and worker surveillance, <coughs> and even implants in workers so they can be monitored constantly. In education, um, in a context where education is being increasingly neoliberalized, there are issues such as trying to replace or downgrade teachers by replacing them with technology, who controls school data, including mm -hmm. cameras in classrooms, which is a very sensitive issue because they're dealing with children, um, and issues related to distance control of curriculum rather than local control and copyright policy. <coughs> in health, uh, intellect, uh, artificial intelligence and robots Robotics can mean enormous advances in health technology, um, distance operations, deafness implants, uh, there's even 3D organ printers now starting to be tested. But there's also serious threats such as discrimination in health insurance through artificial intelligence. Um, uh, and the number of impacts on health and the environments from the massive implementation of, of technology. Um, briefly, 
coming to the alternatives and the contradictions. The central contradiction, as we see it in the digital area, is the dispute between, on the one hand, this concentrated corporate project of surveillance capitalism and digital intellectual property, which is frequently allied with security agencies and the military. And on the other hand, what we call the people's internet or, or the internet of citizens that proposes a decentralized project based on distributed technology, the commons, uh, where information, technology, and power would tend to be shared. These, these, um, both these projects exist, they've coexisted since the beginning of the internet, and the corporate, poly the corporate model is tending to weigh the greater in the balance as time moves on. But um, they sometimes work in cooperation, often in conflict. Um, and I think one of the solutions is how do we strengthen the people's internet model. So this means things like free and open software initiatives um, and platforms social me uh, for social media, a distributed infrastructure, open knowledge initiatives, development of security and encryption for users in general. And as the corporate model dominates today, it's important to confront it not only from the marginality of local and small-scale initiatives, which is what tends to be the case, but to see it as being at the heart of the dispute of, for our future societies and therefore a crucial issue to be addressing at every level. Um, just a few of the things that are in debate at the moment. Um, the focus on privacy, protecting privacy, is important, but it's not sufficient um, because it doesn't go to the power issues present. Uh, and because surveillance, as I mentioned, is at the heart of the, the model. Uh, who should own or control data? Can you, can, there's a debate on whether you can actually own aggregated data at all. Um, but I think there's an, an agreement that its control is fundamental. So can we talk about community control of how data is used, community decision on how, you know, what, what can and can't be done with our data, who can use it, what can they use it for, and how can it be used in benefit of the community rather than in benefit of big corporations. The individual solution isn't a solution because, as I think here was just mentioning to me when we, when we came in, um, Individual solutions means every time you say yes to something, you know, you have to read all of this and you can't be bothered and you don't understand it anyway and you read all, even if you do read it through, you don't really know what it means. So that just isn't a solution. The opt-in, opt-out isn't a solution. So that needs to be done at the community level, which gives you greater negotiating power. Um, how to tax big corporations for social benefit, they're not being taxed largely. Anti-monopoly law, this is now being discussed even in the US, um, to break up the big corporations. What do we replace them with? Would these be non-profit or publicly run alternatives? Uh, how will we fund them? Size issues, etc. Uh, digital power is a category that needs to be redefined. The state, for the moment, is the only instrument available for redistribution, but its class character, therefore, is very important. Uh, localism can be a solution to many digital issues, but some of our problems can only be solved transnational, transnationally. How do we do that? Um, even within communities, for control, there are inequalities and power dynamics, so how do we deal with that? Uh, and if digital resources are in principle communitized, what would be appropriate principles, frameworks, and means of government for that? So that's just a few of the, the issues. Um, just to close, there's the proposal that was mentioned at the beginning of an internal <coughs> social forum under the umbrella of the World Social Forum. This hasn't yet taken place, but there's a number of initiatives going on with the idea that we should have a global space to discuss these issues that's not under a neoliberal framework, 
and the World Social Forum is an appropriate place to do that. Um, and whether or not it happens as a forum, we really need to have a lot of debate on, on these kind of questions and a lot of other questions that we haven't had time to go into. So, I hope that wasn't too much in too short a time, but... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, 15 minutes left. No. Yeah, that's the rest. Right. Um, you, do you have any questions? We can take them right away. Questions for me? Mm, yes. Uh, you mentioned before, um, so you say that you, you say that you have these two models of how the internet should look like and they usually work in opposition but sometimes in collaboration. What's an example of a collaboration that, uh, that has happened? Okay, for example, free software, free and open source software, there are corporations working with that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's not necessarily that free open source software is always opposed to privately owned software. They're sometimes integrated. So that's just one example. Uh, I just want uh, yeah. Yeah. go ahead. Um, I heard something the other day that I didn't understand, and maybe you can help me understand it. Was this guy talking about digital economy? And I sorry about it. He was talking about digital economy, and I understand very little. Very study economics, and he said data is now the new money. And now you said it can't be owned; it can only be controlled. And my brain's like, this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Right. How can it be the new money? Data. Or what is it? Data. Yeah. yeah. Right. Data is not so much money. It's um, it's the input. It's like it's like in colonial times, um, gold was extracted, right? Mm -hmm. um, it didn't have a value in itself. It was given a value by by those who extracted it and used it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, your individual data probably isn't worth much in itself, yeah, to you except for um, non, non, totally non-monetary reasons, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and it acquires value as it's transformed and processed and aggregated with other data, okay. In, in the personal case, it could be the things you're interested in or seem to be interested in that will be of interest to advertisers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, a, your, your aggregated data is then sold on to an advertiser or at a, at a collective level, uh, say in a city, or if you use Google Maps, for example, mm -hmm. right? You're constantly giving feedback to Google Maps, and that's used for uh, other people in the community to know whether there's a traffic jam. Okay. Um, and so this is used in a collective sense. Yeah. Now, if you look at it from a community, the big companies think they own the data. Mm. Okay. Uh, but if you look at it in a collective sense, the data on on um, traffic congestion should belong to the city from my point of view. Okay. Mm -hmm. To the city community. Yeah. So there could be laws that say the data all the data that's taken from sensors around and cameras around the city belongs to the city and companies can use it at a price or in exchange for returning a service to the city. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it's that kind of that kind of thing. Um, advertisers should return something in return for what for the data they they get for selling things to you. That there should be some sort of tax on how they do that, for example, which benefits the community you're part of, for example. It you know it's not been worked out yet. We're still trying to think how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of the general idea. So it's very hard to say who owns aggregated data because it's, do you actually own it or do you just control what it's used for? It's, it's kind of the debate. 
But I think the control issue is more important. Mm. Well, surely the platforms own the data. Do they? <laughs> yeah, have you tried to purchase them? Huh? Have you tried to uh, try to purchase, uh, tried to access data from Facebook and from Twitter and all these things? It costs a lot of money, and they have the gateway right. to it. They say they own it because there's no regulation that says they don't. They don't. Right. Right. But should they? Is there any reason why data should own your data? Why Facebook should own your data because you use their service? Yeah. They're offering you so they're, they're getting far more out of you than you get out of them. Mm. So I mean, yes, at the moment practically they own it. But right. the, the, so the point right. is, what uh, alternative model could we be looking at, and does it involve ownership control? You know, how, how could this be done? I mean, it's obviously very complex because if we talk about community data on a national level. Uh, are we talking about the government controlling that? And do we trust our governments to control that? A lot of people don't. Yeah. Or if not, what could be an alternative model to that? So it's not easy. Can I say that I'm going to have a cup of water? So I'm going to go back to Pushin, sir. I'm going to try to get the first level. So on the first level, they collect data by by offering the service uh, uh, free and get data in return. That's the general problem. But, but the big product or advantage they have is by using this data on a large scale. So Google uh, can collect enough, in enough information to have a very good picture of the health risks of religions. If, if you collect a lot of money, Everything people is googling, what they are buying, and, and so on. You can get a, a, a macro picture and also a, a, an individual picture of health risks. And when they, they then run an insurance company and run health services, these data can be of very high value. If you have a, a, a you, if it's the data you can extract from uh, aggregated data with better models. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, you, you can uh, extract much more precise levels of risk. And th this is what the Norwegian Health Services is worried about at the moment. They have a big conference next month. What should the, the public services do in order to not be surpassed by Google and others very soon on information on the health situation in the Norwegian population? Mm -hmm. the, the, because this amount of data is. Uh, is, uh, is so valuable when you use the, the, when you have a lot of data and use it on a large scale. But I <coughs> wonder, uh, but you can't you can't collect health sensitive data under GDPR without. Uh, oh, no, but you can uh, do if you collect. Um, there are many sources of data. Your, your consumption, your activities. So obviously, but a, a lot of data that on an aggregated level can, can give a picture. Of, of course, this health data can sometimes also be, be collected through the use of medicine and, and whatever. But GDPR is regulated uh, for some of these activities. But um, um, then it's a question, of course, of, uh, of how we can uh, enforce G GDPR. Uh, I think I think it's Microsoft that says it's experimented with um, diagnosing the probability of a person having certain illnesses mm. simply through their search activity. Um, the kind of things you search for have a lot to do with the things that are bothering you health-wise. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts about taxation of this government or of this government <coughs> or um, Well, it, just, just before coming to taxation, I think the monopoly issue is really important because uh, there's a tendency towards what's called natural monopolies because uh, people tend to go to a service that their friends are on or their clients are on or or where they can get better, inf more and better information, like search, search engines. 
um, people tend to flow towards the bigger companies, you know, which means they get bigger, and then they can push the smaller ones out or buy them up. So this tendency towards natural monopolies is creating a huge power imbalance. Yeah. So, you know, in previous um, phases of the economy, there's been legislation, anti-monopoly legislation, precisely to restrict that. So I think that's something that's really important. I think that more important than taxing is breaking up the big monopolies. But obviously, these big monopolies are transnational. There's not much you can do from Norway or from Ecuador. Um, uh, to, uh, to do that, so <laughs> practically the U.S. needs to make up it, it's been monopolies. And as far as taxation is concerned, um, yes, I think it's important, but how do you do that from a small country? It's very, it's very complicated, but it certainly needs to be looked at. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> well, just on, on that on that particular point, uh, you say that it's absolutely true that there are natural monopolies. But if you look <coughs> at, because uh, I, I think what you're really talking about is the platform economy when you're talking about monopolies, right? So that's I, and the social, yeah, the, the the social networking, which, which are platforms. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and uh, but if you look at different, at least different bigger countries and different bigger regions, right? It's not like Uber is the dominant <coughs> player in Southeast Asia, uh, yet. you know. Mm. Hmm? Yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, why, but why would they be? Like, you already have Grab, you already have these other platforms. You mm -hmm. have in, in Russia, you have Yandex and, and Kondakte, who will, there's no reason to believe that they will be sub superseded by Google or, or Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, in China, there's no reason to believe that, uh, that they're, you know, Badu and what have you um, and then of course within each of those countries you know say the Chinese WeChat they're themselves becoming this sort of like Medusa of growing more and more services and becoming this big platform you know the yeah um, Yandex also doing the same thing they're becoming both the Amazon and the, and, and, and the heavy market functions and so on so but still geography culture regulatory um, boundaries within both like regional and national boundaries seem to have a big effect, right? So you can't just say like, oh, it's just global, just because mm -hmm. in small countries here we have adopted this general Western, like we use Facebook and Google and so on. Yes and no. Um, Russia and China are different because they have state policy on this. Mm -hmm. So that's one way you can go, is have state policy that restricts the presence of these transnationals. Um, there was just about a year ago, there was a fight in India because their biggest e-commerce company, I forget its name, um, had a takeover bid from, I think it was Amazon. And there was a big fight from farmers and street sellers to stop this takeover bid happening, which India could have done, and they, they authorized it. So, yes and no. <laughs> um, Would you say that that's just due to policy, though? Because, say, for example... If well, I'm saying policy can play an important role. Mm -hmm. right. yeah? And <laughs> India had its big e-commerce company, and now Flipkart. <coughs> and now it's been taken over by, by, I think it was Amazon. So, these things move very fast. Right. But they will converge by being bought up in the way that Facebook has bought up all the... Mm -hmm different social media services. Yeah. Services. Yeah. But would there not be better ways to do it? Because obviously having a shared like, internet, like, like you can access parts of the internet from China or even the VPN. So like internationally, there's also value in having access to the same kind of information. Wouldn't some other way of regulating this be better? Um, and like it's like what is the yes no what what, what I, I'm not sure where the point is going. It's just a question because you yeah. said now you can regulate it like China and Russia. Well, I mean, one it's option one option is for countries, especially bigger yeah. countries, small ones, it's harder to regulate um, what companies can invest and uh, or 
to invest in developing their own technology as Russia and China have done. So that's one option. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not saying if it's ideal or it's not ideal. I'm just saying that that exists as a possibility. Um, what's not much of a solution is when countries completely abdicate that right and let the big companies come in and do whatever they want with no regulation. So, and that's going to happen if the WTO negotiation on e-commerce comes through because then they won't be able to regulate a lot of these things. So, uh, yeah. you know, it'll, it'll, it'll put strict controls on what they can regulate. Yeah, uh, time is up. Uh, to know more about the new international rules that have been written uh, right now, uh, you can go to the FF website. Norway is participating in the negotiations with about this new trade agreement regulating uh, digital economy. So a lot of things are happening. Um, thanks, Sally, for a very uh, a good talk. Um, and thanks to you all for showing up and asking uh, interesting questions and discussing. Uh, Sally, you're going to have a lot of these in the next few days. <laughs> so here's the first uh, of many oh. small gifts after you talk. <laughs> She's going to talk a lot in the next days. So, uh, Jonas, do you want to say anything about uh, the other stuff that uh, people yeah. can... Uh, just, just, uh, just an announcement. If any of you read Spanish, I have a few <laughs> magazines relating to some of these things. One of them is on the economy in general. Um, and this one on social justice in a digitalized world, if you don't read Spanish, it's on the internet in English. Um, and so you might be interested. It, it was on this debate we had in, in Bangkok uh, three or four months ago in, on all of these issues. So. Uh, <coughs> I'll put the I'll put email address. Hey, go ahead, Jonas. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about Norsk. Uh, I would like first to thank the attack for uh, the summary of the Norwegian social forum and share it with the media. It was very fint. We have we have this week invited many many activists, especially from the global south, to go kom til Norge for å snakke om problemløsninger, altså problemer og løsninger man har på lokale problemer eller kampanjer man har hatt lokalt. Vi har i kveld har vi et møte om organisasjonsbygging og sivilsamfunn i Zambia i samarbeid med Fellesrådet til Afrika, hvis noen er interessert i det. Men på lørdagen så kan du dere røde fra meg fra oss særlig. Da skal vi snakke mer om det. Internet Social Forum. Uh, vi vill ha aktivister från Colombia, från Zambia, från Nepal, från Hong Kong uh, och från Irak. Alla kommer att snacka om lokala problem och lokala kampanjer som har varit vällyckade uh, i deras respektive land. Uh, och detta är då stamma som bara kommer från det globala söder som själv nu får höra speciellt med om här i Norge där vi har väldigt sån vänsterlig kontext. Uh, den enda som har en vänsterlig bakgrund och vi blir inbjudet att prata som inte är norska och Sally då som då bor i Ecuador i 30 år så man kan kalla över för globala söder det som vi själv må är förlåt. Eh detta är då ett seminarium på ett på Melahuset på lördagen för de som är intresserade i det. Det blir ett halvdagsseminarium så det är gratis mat eh, för alla som vill ha och oss som vill gratis att delta. Så vi hoppas att ni är välkomna och så tackar jag för mötet. Kan du skriva upp internet på adressen av deras halvdag? Och så är det har ett 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 seminarium till 2 oktober klockan 7 på Dekmanske bibliotek på Skärsplats på Lycka. Eh där ska Martine Thorvang som är ledare för att tack för att med om det här sammen med en som heter Sophie Bishop som är undervisare på King's College i London eh om digital ekonomi och hon har forskat på politisk ekonomi bak eh skönhetsvideobloggare på Youtube. Så det är väldigt väldigt kul exempel vilken vad slags ekonomisk drivkraft som ligger bak smickvideor på Youtube. Så det är eh blir väl Bra, andra oktober 7. Så det